Good morning, and thank you for joining us at the 2022 Fairfax County Housing Symposium. My name is Ben Boxer, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this event presented by the Fairfax County Redevelopment and Housing Authority and the Housing and the, and the George Mason University School of Business. Today, we are celebrating the third anniversary of the symposium. When it launched in 2020, excuse me, we were having a slight technical difficulty. All right, today we are celebrating the third anniversary of the Housing Symposium. When the event was launched in 2020, it was our desire to open a community dialogue to broaden our vision and understanding of affordable housing as a, as a significant factor in the overall well-being of individuals, families, and communities. Over the last three years, we have seen how that paradigm shift has yielded stronger resolve, innovative solutions, and significant results in the delivery of affordable housing throughout our community. In that spirit, we welcome you to today's symposium as we further the discussion by addressing several key issues facing Fairfax County and housing authorities throughout the region. Before we get underway, we would like to extend our sincere thanks to our sponsors and partners of today's event, the Northern Virginia Association of Realtors and Virginia Housing. We're very appreciative to both of these organizations for their continued support and partnership and look forward to hearing from them later today. We would also like to welcome and thank all of our distinguished speakers. We're very privileged to have a power packed roster for today, and we thank you for taking the time to be a part of this year's event. Before we get underway, I would like to point out the Q&A icon in your Zoom menu. We invite you to use this option to inform us if you're having any technical difficulties with Zoom. We have staff standing by who may be able to assist you. Please note that staff may not be able to resolve issues pertaining to connectivity in your home or office, or with regard to personal and security preferences on your device. Without any further ado, I'm happy to introduce our first speakers of the morning. We will first be pleased to hear from Dr. Maury Piperl, Dean of the George Mason University School of Business. In addition to his position at the university, Dr. Piperl serves as a member of the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce, Leadership Greater Washington, the Economic Club of Washington, DC, and is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in the United Kingdom. Dr. Piper is a renowned authority on change, talent, particularly leadership that crosses markets and borders. Following Dr. Piper's remarks, we will hear from Melissa McKenna, Chairman of the Fairfax County Redevelopment and Housing Authority. Chairman McKenna has a distinguished history of leadership in public service, having served on the Herndon Town Council, Herndon Planning Commission, and the Drainsville District Area Plans Review Task Force. Chairman McKenna also served as the co-chair of the Affordable Housing Resource Panel and was an integral part of the group's effort to provide recommendations and strategies to the Board of Supervisors for achieving the county's housing goals. Following her opening remarks, Chairman McKenna will lead us through the rest of this morning's session. Dr. Piperl, the time is yours. Thank you so much, Ben. That's a very generous and wonderful welcome. And I wanna thank everyone at Fairfax County for their partnership these last few years. It has been a wonderful effort and one that, of course, has been um, changed by circumstance, not entirely in a bad way, but it was the very last event. Our first event together was the very last event that we held uh, in Merton Hall at George Mason before we had to close for COVID. So I'm really thrilled we had, we made it happen and we've been partnering together since then. Affordable housing is key to any vibrant community, to any thriving local business and it's something that we've committed to together it's it's part of george mason university and especially the school of business's focus as a force for good in the world that's what we aim to be we are particularly looking forward to the one university project which is now under construction just across from our campus and north uh, of the field house on 123 not only uh, will this provide more student dorms it'll also deliver 240 new affordable housing units for the community and our new neighbors really very much looking forward to that. This morning, uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the symposium, uh, first of all, the Deputy Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Adrian Todman. Thank you so much for being here with us, uh, Secretary. I want to, I was, I was looking forward to welcoming back uh, Congressman Connolly, who's been with us before. Um, unfortunately, he's not uh, able to join us at the last moment this morning. However, very fortunately, uh, his colleague, Maddie White, who is Deputy Director of Outreach for Congressman Connolly, will be with us this morning. And of course, I want to welcome back 
Fairfax County Board of Supervisors Chair Jeff McKay, thank you for your longstanding partnership and for your dedication uh, to our work together. All our distinguished speakers today, today I'd love to uh, welcome and thank you all for being here virtually at George Mason University, which, as you may know, has been operating both virtually and face-to-face -face, and in a variety of hybrid ways over these last few years to make sure that we're able to serve the students and the wider community uh, as best we can. And touch wood, as I say, uh, we've been able to do it pretty safely. So all credit to the careful planning and the very uh, responsible work that we've all been able to uh, do together. We really look forward to welcoming everyone back uh, in person next year, good luck uh, onto our campus in Fairfax, which as most of you know, just about bridges uh, the Fairfax County line uh, and the, the town of Fairfax line. So we are really um, in the middle and we are serving that wider community for whom the affordable housing is so central and really, really pleased to be able to be in this partnership with you all today. So that said, Welcome all. I'd like to turn it over to Melissa McKenna, again, the chair of the Fairfax County Redevelopment and Housing Authority, our partners in this work, for her welcome remarks and then for her leadership of the panel. And I just want to thank all of our friends uh, and in particular looking forward to see my friend Victor Hoskins uh, run this next panel after uh, Melissa starts us. So thank you all. Melissa, welcome and good to see you. Thank you, Dr. Piperell. It's great to see you as well. Um, we are, of course, very happy to have you uh, sponsoring us again and to partner with you. Um, today, the 2022 Housing Symposium will take us to a deeper dive into the housing industry's best practices, solutions, and conceptual principles upon which we can form solid strategies to serve the housing needs and fill gaps that exist within our communities. The FCRHA, in partnership with the Fairfax County Government and George Mason University School of Business, has organized an event that will allow us to discuss several key topics facing Fairfax County and housing authorities across the country. These include enabling economic mobility through affordable housing, narrowing the wealth gap for homeownership, and expanding opportunities through innovation in policy, design, and development. Um, we, as Dr. Piperell mentioned, are very honored to have the um, diverse and very experienced list of speakers that will be joining us today, and hopefully most of you have had the opportunity to look through our agenda, but we are really um, happy to see industry like uh, Beezer Homes, Habitat for Humanity, um, McGuire Woods joining us um, people involved in supporting the community and moving things forward like Amazon um, and lots of different um, organizations that um, I will not go through all of them, but uh, we have great sampling today. Um, as uh, Ben mentioned early on, over the past three years, we have grown this event from its actual original inception in just one classroom with about 30 people involved to today's event where we have over uh, 300 people registered from across the region. And that makes me really happy to see not only how we've grown this event, but also um, to have people from across the region participating because this is a topic that impacts us as a region and as a nation. And so having these eyes and this expertise and this opportunity to learn and think together is so important. Um, this didn't come together easily. I do want to take a moment to thank the partners that made today and the growth of this event possible. Um, and that first I will put out to my colleague on the FCRHA, Eric Mary Bojic, who has done such tremendous work in building that partnership and bridge between George Mason and our organization to take this event to where it is. And I'll further extend that to my um, entire family of commissioners on the FCRHA. Thank you for your work, your commitment, and um, the thought that you put into what you do. We couldn't do that without the support of housing and community development. So a huge thank you to everyone on the team that uh, really makes things happen for us here in Fairfax County. And that, of course, is supported by our Board of Supervisors. So thank you to all of you for everything that you do to remain committed to this mission and drive things forward. 
Um, my last thank you call out is specifically um, to the folks who have helped to run this organization from within housing and community development. Vin Rogers, Linda Hoffman, Ben Boxer, and Tom Fleetwood, thank you for your commitment and your hard work um, that we put in over the course of the year to keep this event moving forward. That hard work that the FCRHA does um, was recently recognized in the Affordable Housing News Magazine in its winter 21 edition, or, or winter 22, like 21, 21 edition. Um, over the course of these last two years, and in spite of the challenges brought upon us by the pandemic, the FCRHA has continued to achieve new heights in providing housing to those who need it most. From our administration of housing voucher programs serving more than 20,000 residents to advancing innovations in policy and investments to preserve and develop units of affordable housing all throughout the county, the FCRHA is increasingly being recognized across the country as a leader in the housing community. As Dr. Piper pointed out, a prime example of this is right here in our virtual backyard today with the One University Project. The project really marked a historical milestone in becoming the first rental assistance demonstration or RAD converted property to obtain US Department of Housing and Urban Development approval for demolition and redevelopment. The development uh, will deliver in the end 120 units of affordable multifamily housing and 120 units of affordable senior independent living, in addition to 333 units of student housing on a 10.8 acre property. This is such an exemplary project for how we've come together and created a place that really um, will be a, a town and gown sort of mix of where we have learning, we have different ages, and I'm so proud of the work that has happened there. Um, throughout the development phase, FCRHA and HUD really had to work closely to blaze a trail to create a process that hopefully will be able to be modeled um, in other communities across the nation. Uh, in the end, we are quintupling the number of affordable homes currently available on this site and bringing much needed student housing to George Mason. This project is representative of the creativity that is needed today to do any project in affordable housing and to build communities that are equitable. Uh, at the FCRHA and across the country and organizations like ours, the mission is to preserve, to protect, and to produce housing. And I am so proud of the work that we are doing to take care of all of the residents that, that we are serving in our community. Um, during this pandemic, I cannot even begin to tell you the immense work that our teams have put into protecting people and keeping things moving forward. So thank you again to everyone in our organization who's made that possible. Housing is and always will be more than sticks and bricks. It is the foundation for so many things. And today we really look forward to exploring how housing intersects with the economic recovery, with um, growth and with um, bringing opportunity to people. Uh, there are so many things that we're going to explore today. I'm super excited uh, for all of the speakers that we have and to see the ideas that come out of this. Something that Victor Hoskins said to us last year and I hope that we can all remember today is that it's great to share ideas, but it's what we do with them that really matters. So if you are moved, sparked by something today, I hope that you will take it back to your community and find a way to try new things and to be brave to make our communities better in this really important area. We are so honored today to have the speakers that are joining us um, this morning. I am very, very pleased to uh, introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker is going to be the Deputy Secretary for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And this is Adrian Todman. Um, Adrian currently serves as the 12th Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. She's the first black woman to ever hold this position. As Deputy Secretary, she joined Secretary Marsha Fudge in leading more than 7,000 HUD employees in expanding housing opportunity for Americans in every state and territory. Throughout her career, Deputy Secretary Todman has prioritized improving people's lives and strengthening our communities. 
Prior to her most recent tenure at HUD, she acted as CEO of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. At NARO, she helped advance the interests of 20,000 housing and community development agencies that serve 8 million people across America. Before joining NARO, Deputy Secretary Todman served as the Executive Director of the District of Columbia Housing Authority, the DCHA. At DCHA, she increased homeownership opportunities for families of modest means, expanded DC's supply of affordable housing, and implemented a national award-winning model to house veterans experiencing homelessness. In addition to these roles, Deputy Secretary Todman previously served in various career positions at HUD, first as a manager of a $500 million grant competition focused on the redevelopment of distressed public housing sites, then as a policy aide in both the Office of Public and Indian Housing and the Office of the Secretary. Deputy Secretary Todman firmly believes that America has a responsibility to confront housing insecurity, to eliminate all forms of housing discrimination, and to make our nation's infrastructure more equitable and resilient. Deputy Secretary Todman is a graduate of Smith College. She began her career working in the office of then Congressman Ron DeLugo, the long-serving delegate representing the U.S. Virgin Islands, where she was born and raised. Deputy Secretary Todman, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman McKenna. And I, another reminder to my staff, I need to shorten my bio um, <laughs> so we can get to it. Uh, thank you all, and, and, you know, and, and good morning, Fairfax County. How are you? One of the proudest things um, uh, that I, I feel in my entire career is being one of you in this region trying to promote housing, affordable housing, economic development through housing, um, through a, a pretty uh, substantial moment in my career. So I will say that I've been a student and a practitioner of the role that housing plays um, in this region um, for many, many years. And I have taken everything I've learned and done and it sits with me in this office um, as I am helping the secretary and the president navigate housing issues across the country. So thank you all for your leadership. You've all played a role in things that I have learned. And um, I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to some of my former colleagues during that journey. And that's um, your very own Victor Hoskins, who is a dear friend of mine, and Catherine Buell, who you'll be hearing from a little bit later. Good morning to both of you. And I'd like to, even in his absence, thank so much uh, Chair Congressperson uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry Connolly for the leadership that he has brought to this issue and so, so many others, um, particularly the American Rescue Plan. So thank you, uh, Congressperson, and thank you to his staff who has joined us today. Look, um, you're going to hear a lot from the local experts about what's happening in Fairfax counties and ways that, as the chairperson indicated, that housing is more than sticks and bricks because it, it, it's so, it is in so many different ways. I'm going to talk um, a little bit about what's happening inside of the administration. One of the reasons that I was um, so proud and humbled to become a part of this administration is that they believe in the power of housing. This president, this vice president, and our secretary Fudge believe in the power of housing. And I will say, many of you have probably been around for a little bit and know that that has not always been the case. Housing has always been this thing that we will get to, but that is not what's happening in this administration. Um, housing and the issues around housing supply and housing demand are top of mind across leadership, across the administration, but particularly where it matters most, and that's inside the White House. And we saw that from the very first moments that this president um, uh, took leadership. Inside of the American Rescue Plan, as many of you know, not only do we have an infusion of billions of dollars to help families across the country with rent relief because of the economic strife caused by the pandemic, but we also saw um, tucked in there some really critical infusions of investments of new vouchers um, to help many of our in, help many of our families who are uh, homeless or potentially going to experience homelessness, but also an, a, an infusion of home dollars as well, which I know many of you know is critical as we try to build new affordable housing for people of low and modest means. I mean, these infusions of funds should not be um, taken lightly. 
um, you know, you, you know, money to get this work done is critical. Resources, very, very critical. So right out of the gate, we saw that commitment. And then that was followed by the president's 22 proposed budget, where we saw increases in the HUD proposal, HUD proposed budget that we haven't seen in, in some years. And I'm very excited that when this president and this secretary requested more vouchers, just last week, the Congress has approved more vouchers um, um, for, for all of the housing authorities to be able to help house families in their homes families in their communities. Um, we also, act, the president also asked for more home funds um, and we're very pleased that the Congress was able to approve an additional infusion of home funds over and above last year's budget and certainly the budgets before then um, so that you all have that tool in your toolkit that you can help with your capital stack as you're trying to make sure you're building in affordability into your communities. Um, and there's so many other wonderful things that the president proposed that the Congress has acted on um, inside of the budget that was that, that was uh, 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 approved just last week. I encourage all of you to dig in and, and feel free to reach out to me and others here at HUD to learn more about how we are looking to roll out those, uh, those programs and those new ideas. Um, just last September, uh, there was an all of government approach to how do we increase the housing supply. And for HUD's part, um, we re-engaged our friends at Treasury on a risk sharing initiative that allows HFAs across the country to be able to produce more housing. And we believe that through that one initiative, um, we're able to get up to upwards of 30,000 units across the country in just the next several years. In addition to that, um, HUD took a unprecedented role of looking at some of the assets we had in our possession, uh, whether it was um, through our actions or through some of our, uh, you know, um, our, 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 our real estate owned um, units. Um, we are actually, um, not, not actually, we have actually um, looked at those assets as ways that we can infuse local government, local government housing authorities like yours, um, other towns across the country, nonprofits, really purpose missioned, um, public missioned entities to help repurpose those homes um, so that we can get more owner occupants in there. Heretofore, um, there has been an infusion of investors who look to you know, buy those homes and not necessarily with a, um, a high public purpose in mind. But what we have done is provided an opportunity for nonprofits, um, local agencies, towns to be able to, um, uh, to bid on and get access to those homes, um, particularly single family homes and our smaller, uh, our smaller two to four bedroom um, buildings so that we are able to get more owner occupants in there in an affordable way. Um, HUD has not done that before to my knowledge and we are exploring ways that we can able to do more to make sure that supply is getting into what we think is uh, the, 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 the hands that will put those units to the highest and best use as it relates to the topics that you all will be discussing today. Um, and I, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't discuss the historic infusion of ideas and resources that was proposed in Build Back Better. For any of you who have been in the housing industry for the past several decades, this was a phenomenal piece of work. The HUD staff worked literally day and night working with our administration colleagues and with folks on the Hill to make sure that this proposal was taking care of homeownership and rental and homelessness issues um, in entire, in, inside of the entire housing ecosystem. While we were very disappointed, as I'm sure you all were, that it did not get across the finish line, one of the messages I want to make sure to bring to you today is that those conversations have not stopped. Um, notwithstanding what happened in December, I know that I am, the secretary is, and other of my colleagues here at HUD having daily conversations inside the administration in terms of ways that we can keep those ideas alive and put back out there. So more to come, more to come on that front. Um, I wanted to share just um, um, two other quick ideas. One is that in addition, to being very supportive through everything the White House is doing in terms of housing supply and demand. Um, HUD has taken on some of its own initiatives. House America is an initiative of the secretaries, which is really 
um, uh, really uh, pushing many of our local and state leaders to maximize the use of the brand new vouchers that are available to localities across the country, but also the home funds in a way that is outcome focused and used in an urgent fashion. There are 70,000 new vouchers across the country. We wanna make sure that we're getting folks into units. And there's $5 billion in new home funds. We wanna make sure that units are being built. So how is America is a challenge to localities across the country that we are gonna get those resources out there in a way that we are making sure that we're keeping, we're saying family focused and individual focused in getting those resources used. Um, so we, we look forward to your participation in that. In addition, we're very excited with the partnership we already have with Fairfax County and the chairperson um, mentioned one university and the rental um, assistance demonstration program, RAD. I won't get into all the specifics of RAD. I know many of you already know that, but we're thrilled to have been able to play a role in lifting up that really innovative initiative and being the first RAD deal to have that larger scale of, of, of investment and work that would be done. So congratulations to you all as you get that underway. Um, and of course, Fairfax County continues to be a partner with HUD as you are deploying your home funds, as you're deploying your CDBG, as you're deploying all of the, your, your, emergency, your emergency solutions grants, all of the resources that HUD provides. Um, I know that with the leadership that you have, um, and, I, and I come with some level of expertise there, um, you all are in great hands and are really making things work. I wanna thank you on behalf of the secretary for inviting um, HUD to this and really look forward to what you all will be saying today and good luck and have a wonderful rest of your session. Stay well. Thank you so much, Deputy Secretary. We appreciate your partnership, your support and your kind words. And I only hope that I can help us develop a collection of groundbreaking shovels like yours because we have a lot of work to do and we wanna keep doing great things with you. So thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks. Uh, moving on to our next speaker this morning, um, we are uh, was, we were very hopeful to have Congressman Jerry Conley join us. Unfortunately, as uh, as I read on Twitter last week, he um, picked up COVID while in Poland, and so he is still recovering. So, um, if you happen to be watching Congressman Conley. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, I did wear green for you and we miss having you here today, but we are super excited to be joined by Maddie White, who is the Deputy Director of Outreach for Congressman Conley. Maddie has worked with Congressman Conley since 2016 and is a graduate of James Madison University. Um, she is really lucky to be able to work with Congressman Conley. Uh, Congressman Conley um, is serving his seventh term in the House of Representatives from Virginia's 11th district, which includes Fairfax County, Prince William, and the city of Fairfax in Northern Virginia. Prior to his election to Congress, he served 14 years on the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, including five years as the chairman. Throughout his career, um, protecting and growing Northern Virginia's economy was and remains one of his top priorities. In Congress, he's played a key role in securing federal dollars for transportation improvements in Northern Virginia, including the completion of the Fairfax County Parkway, widening the Prince William County Parkway, providing ongoing support for rail to Dulles, and securing the annual federal commitment of $150 million for the regional metro system. Congressman Conley is a senior member of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform and serves as the chairman of the Subcommittee on Government Operations. In his role, he's responsible for shaping government-wide policy for a broad range of issues, including federal workforce and federal agency oversight, uh, federal procurement and information policy, national drug policy, regulatory reform, the U.S. Postal Service, the U.S. Census Bureau, and the District of Columbia. Congressman Conley also serves on the House Committee for Foreign Affairs. Using his extensive background in foreign policy, including as a senior staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he's become a leading voice on foreign assistance reform, war powers, embassy security, and democracy protection abroad. 
Prior to his election to Congress, Congressman Conley served as chairman of the Board of Supervisors and earned a reputation there as a pragmatic leader for his initiatives to expand affordable housing, reduce gang violence, promote reusable energy, and advance critical transportation improvements. During his tenure on the board, Fairfax was recognized as a best managed county. He received his MA in public administration from Harvard, and he received a BA in literature from Marymount uh, College. I'm sorry, Mary Knoll College. I'm, I'm being a little Northern Virginia specific there, right? <laughs> he lives in Fairfax still with his wife, uh, Smitty, and his daughter, Caitlin. And Maddie, thank you for stepping in today. We really appreciate you being here. Yeah, thank you so much. I think my new life goal is getting a bio as long as Jerry. Um, <laughs> a hard task, but very accomplished. So I know I can't fully fill his shoes, but thank you for having me. I do appreciate the green. I was going to mention it. Um, as people, fans with Team Connolly, uh, it's the holiest day of the year. So we appreciate holding this event on such a great day. The luck of the Irish is not with him, though. He's still recovering from COVID, like Melissa said, but he sends his best wishes. And we would be remiss to not be a part of this event as affordable housing has been one of his top priorities throughout his life of public service, decades of public service. Um, he always says that housing is the cornerstone to ensuring an economic success and opportunity for all. Um, I think his record speaks to that and his commitment to it, uh, even from back as chairman, uh, Penny for Affordable Housing. I, he likes to boast that it was 27 million um, on the penny in five years when he was chairman. So the hefty sum to be able to complete some of these projects uh, like Government uh, Center One, which he helped Kind of initiate, which we now saw as the appropriations package passed, um, there will be another 1.5 million coming to Fairfax County to further that development. Um, I know FCH, FCRHA and Fairfax County have set an incredible goal of 5,000 new affordable homes, um, and this will ideally help get towards that goal with 250 new units. So we're incredibly excited to see what that will be able to um, achieve. And affordable housing is not a new issue, but COVID has shown a light on the importance of affordable housing. Um, we know in Congress, we have focused a lot on making sure that we were using relief funds to assist people with rental assistance, housing, um, and the county did an amazing job of using those federal funding, using the federal funds to do the same. Um, Deputy Secretary Todman mentioned uh, the money that was in the COVID relief packages for ARPA and CARES. It was about 70 billion um, to assist with rental assistance um, and that housing vouchers and utility assistance as well. Um, I know that made a huge difference in a lot of folks' lives and we need to keep the ball rolling with that. Uh, Build Back Better was a perfect example of keeping that ball rolling um, with another 170 billion to build 1 million new affordable homes. Uh, obviously that's come to a standstill, but we're hopeful that a lot of the bare bones of that will continue on in legislation if we can't get it in its complete package now, but that is the goal and we will continue to push for that. Uh, Congressman Connolly will continue to be an advocate for affordable housing and the partnership that he has with Fairfax County is really the only way to do that. Uh, the federal, local and state partnership is important to making sure that affordable housing is a cornerstone of our platform. Um, and housing is a basic human right, and we mean, need to make sure that we are continuing to focus on that basic human right. Uh, there are plenty of folks who are not as enthusiastic about affordable housing projects. Uh, Jerry spoke to that at the Wind University opening, uh, groundbreaking, how shocking it is that people are not gung-ho about this. Uh, there is a misconception and a stigma that is attached to affordable housing that needs to be dispelled. If we are able, if we are ever able to tackle the housing crisis that we are seeing in Northern Virginia and throughout the world and throughout the country, so just know that Congressman Connolly is your partner in Congress to focus on affordable housing. And I wish he was here. Um, I definitely can't fill his shoes, so I think I've rambled on long enough. So um, I really appreciate being able to be here with you all, and I know that he'll be here with us next year. So have a great St. Patrick's Day. Thank you so much, Melissa, for having me and. Have a great rest of your event. Thank you so much, Maddie. And um, please give our regards to Congressman Conley and um, and thank you for, for all the work that he does. And um, you know, I'm sure that on his recent trip 
over to Poland, um, he saw the impacts firsthand of, of people not having housing. And um, we, you know, keeping today in my heart, the, the millions of people who are displaced and those families that are, are displaced, it's, um, it's really a, a very um, challenging and horrible situation. Um, I, I know that he's doing so much to, to keep us on track there. So thank you for his local commitment and also his global views on things. Um, thank you. Um, wanted to go ahead and move to our next speaker, another real champion on this issue and someone that I am so pleased and honored to be able to work with. And that is Jeff McKay, uh, the chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Chairman McKay is a lifelong Fairfax County resident, uh, born and raised on the historic Route 1 corridor in the Lee District. Jeff has more than 25 years of experience working on behalf of the residents of Fairfax County, first serving for 12 years as then Supervisor Dana Kaufman's Chief of Staff before running and winning the election as Lee District Supervisor in November 2007. He was elected chairman in 2019. Since joining the board, Jeff has been a champion for equity, education, affordable housing, transportation, revitalization, and the environment in Fairfax County. His commitment to these issues has been demonstrated on the board as former chair of the Legislative and Transportation Committees and current chair of the Budget Committee. Jeff is also a regional leader. Currently, he is chair of the Dulles Corridor Advisory Committee and serves on the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, and the Washington uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, as well as on the board of directors for the Virginia Association of Counties, where he is the immediate past president. In addition, he was twice the chair of the NVTC and a member of the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. Jeff's work has been recognized by the Mount Vernon Lee Chamber of Commerce as Citizen of the Year in 2019 by the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions as the recipient of the 2020 Sustainability Champion Legacy Award and by the Fairfax County Park Authority Board as the recipient of the 2021 Chairman's Choice Award. I am so pleased to be joined by Chairman McKay today. And uh, we, we joked at our last event together, which was, was the groundbreaking at one university that we were excited to have Conley, McKenna, and McKay together. We were hoping to do that again today. We all have on the green. Um, so it, we're missing missing our brother here today, but um, happy St. Patrick's Day, sir. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Chair McKenna. And it's, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. And, and we are missing uh, Jerry, although his spirit uh, is here with us today and in the legacy that he built in so many things that we were able to do an affordable housing in Fairfax County, but uh, let me start by wishing everyone uh, also a happy St. Patrick's Day this morning. Um, I think Chair McKenna and Chair McKay collaborated to make sure we were doing this event on a green day, uh, St. Patrick's Day, where we could talk about green, the resources that are needed for affordable housing, uh, which of course is, is a passion of mine, both personally uh, and professionally. And, and personally, uh, for me, I get an opportunity every single morning uh, when I leave my house to come to the government center to drive past uh, Morris Glen, which is an affordable senior uh, community built uh, by the RHA and by Fairfax County uh, many, many years ago in the Alexandria section of Fairfax. And that uh, Morris Glen sign always reminds me every morning um, of what my passion is and, and what my work is to do that day. Uh, the Morris in that Morris Glen is my grandmother, uh, Dorothea Morris, and that uh, affordable housing community was named after her because of all the work that she did over many years uh, advocating for not just affordable housing, but specifically uh, affordable housing for our seniors in Fairfax County. And that was a passion that she instilled in me at a very young age. And we know that uh, seeing that sign is a reminder to me, but it's also a reminder that we still have plenty of work uh, to do in this space. And, and we know that in order to be successful uh, with affordable housing, it takes true partnerships and passion. Um, so that's my personal passion, my professional passion. I have to say, I couldn't be more proud uh, of the work that this Board of Supervisors with the RHA and Fairfax County and so many others have done 
in a relatively short period of time uh, over the last two years, really to significantly move the needle in so many ways on affordable housing, both through policy changes, uh, but also through concrete, literally a uh, number of units of affordable housing that, that we're putting in the ground. Uh, Chair McKenna and I also joked at, at our last event that we felt like it was almost an, a weekly ritual uh, that we would be breaking ground on affordable housing uh, throughout the county. And, and I can remember a time where it might be unusual to do maybe one of those a year, uh, maybe two. Uh, we were on pace there for a while. It felt like doing one every single week. And that's something we can all be you know, very proud of as we try to make ground on providing the needed affordable housing that our community uh, thrives around and, and, and supports and wants more of. And so uh, we know that in order to meet the challenges ahead, and it was uh, mentioned a few minutes ago of the goal that the board set uh, for 5,000 units as a floor for affordable housing by 2034, in order to achieve that, it has to be all hands on deck. Um, and so I am really proud to live in a county and not only where it's a board priority, but also with a robust, sophisticated, aggressive, awesome redevelopment housing authority, uh, our Fairfax County HCD uh, office that does amazing work, uh, certainly our nonprofit partners who take every public dollar we have and stretch it so far in terms of what we can deliver, our industry partners that were mentioned earlier um, are integral to affordable housing. Uh, federal support um, was glad to hear from the deputy secretary and certainly uh, Congressman Connolly has been a big supporter of getting revenues and money uh, to local government to make sure that our federal partners uh, can also help us move this needle. And certainly our state partners who have been involved in, in so many uh, you know, projects throughout Fairfax County, but, but also our region, you know, um, I, I don't know a time, uh, certainly not in my lifetime, where our region is coalescing around an issue so strongly. And with affordable housing, uh, we know this can't just be addressed by one county, by one jurisdiction. We have to all have this on the forefront of, of what we're doing. And so uh, COG is playing a leadership role, but our Northern Virginia localities, the chairs and mayors that you know, I have a pleasure to work with on a daily basis. They are all passionate about affordable housing. So as a region, uh, we are really aggressively tackling this issue in Virginia. And it's because of all those partnerships that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I look back over the last two years and, and just to name a few of the projects, because I, I do want to name some of them, because many of you uh, involved today uh, played a role in these. And, and we're very proud of these. The Arden, uh, North Hill. Uh, ovation at Arrowbrook, One University, uh, Oakwood Senior Apartments, the New Lake Ann House, um, you know, some additional uh, announcements coming soon. Uh, but all of those are significant investments in affordable housing that every time we go to one of these groundbreakings, we learn uh, of a new innovative feature, um, a new level of creativity and collaboration that has made these, these projects happen and that we've broken ground on just in the last two years. Uh, you know, when you think about numbers, I mentioned green earlier, and, and I think this is one that, you know, bears a significant focus as we move forward. And we had a housing committee uh, meeting of the Board of Supervisors earlier this week, and we learned that, you know, in between FY22 and FY23 alone, one year, that the county is approved funding of $94 million going into affordable housing, almost $100 million in one year dedicated towards making affordable housing happen in Fairfax County. And I think it's, it's easy to lose sight of that. It's a significant investment. It's a significant board priority. Those projects that I named a moment ago wouldn't have happened without those financial resources and the commitment of all of you uh, who are involved in this today. Um, and that's why, you know, I want to, to make a little bit of news here uh, with you all, if you haven't already heard this, but I mentioned earlier that the board committed to 5,000 units by 2034. We know that the need is 15,000, but we knew that 5,000 is what we believed we could reasonably achieve in that period of time. Well, with those projects I named, we're at more than 2,000 units in two years in Fairfax County. And so we are well on pace to far eclipse the 5,000 number and go far beyond that. And so at the conclusion of our housing committee on Tuesday, I announced that next week, next Tuesday at our board meeting, 
um, I will bring forward a board matter to officially raise the floor of what our commitment is to 10,000 units so that we can stop talking about 5,000 units because we know we are gonna achieve that in a very short period of time. But let's start talking about 10,000 units and maybe more than that uh, by 2034. And if our commitment and our resolve of all the people involved today and those who are involved who are not with us today continues at the rate that we've been able to go at for the last two years, we will be able to meet really that 15,000 number, but it is time now to raise our floor in Fairfax County from five to 10,000 units by 2034. And I couldn't be prouder to be able to bring that motion forward next Tuesday, not only to show the progress that we've already made, uh, which is significant, but also to continue to challenge ourselves. You know, it, it is helpful every once in a while to look back, reflect and celebrate uh, successes, but it's always good also to aspire and have a challenge to move forward. And I want us to stay motivated, stay challenged, uh, because we know even despite our successes, there is still so much work to do uh, in affordable housing, and we could not do it uh, without the strong partnerships in the public and private and nonprofit sectors. And so uh, on behalf of all the residents of Fairfax County, I want to uh, congratulate you on where we are, uh, celebrate today, um, and in closing, you know, I remember uh, Maury mentioned earlier this morning, uh, the first one of these symposiums at, at George Mason a few years ago, and I remember that one well, and it was a room, classroom uh, setting, and uh, we were all excited to be there. And, you know, I was talking about the goals we had for affordable housing and how big is, it is in terms of importance to Fairfax County. Um, it's hard to believe where we have come from just since that day. When we think about the statistics that I shared here, how quickly, how quickly we have advanced this needle. Uh, we've got to keep at it, uh, a lot of work to do, and I certainly look forward to working with all of you uh, to make sure we not only meet but exceed our revised goal in Fairfax County and that this stays on the forefront of our region in Northern Virginia to tackle this together. So uh, Chair McKenna, great uh, to be with you, especially uh, on St. Patrick's Day to celebrate some happy things, to think about the green uh, that's needed to continue to advance affordable housing. Uh, and with that, I would turn it back to you. Thank you, Chairman McKay. And um, you know, I, I know you're an avid runner. And so clearly you're, you're a gentleman who has set goals in his life. And I love that you just gave us a masterclass in goal setting because when I chaired the Affordable Housing Resource Panel, our biggest contentious moment was deciding what that goal was. And we did agree to put that 5,000 there as and really with that aspirational goal to the Board of Supervisors. And on behalf of that group, I'm gonna say thank you. I'm so excited to hear that we're going to have that motion going forward and um, that we're having the success that we're having with the partnership and the commitment from the board. So thank you for helping us drive this. Looking forward to um, many more opportunities to, to hold shovels and cut ribbons and do great things to meet the needs of our residents. So thank you, Chairman McKay and happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my final introduction today is to introduce Victor Hoskins, the president and CEO of the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. Um, Victor, um, as I said, is the president and CEO of the um, EDA here in Fairfax County. And he, doing that, oversees the growth of the largest economy in Virginia, which ranked number one in the 2019 and 2021 CNBC's America's Top States for Business study. Previously, he directed economic development in Arlington County, where he led the team that brought Amazon's second headquarters, creating 37,500 jobs for Northern Virginia and 100,000 jobs for the DC region. <clears throat> That's a lot, thank you. <laughs> he attracted $4 billion in private capital investment and catalyzed creation of two major technology innovation campuses to build the regional tech talent pipeline. Under Mr. Hoskins' leadership, the FCEDA launched a multifaceted talent initiative aiming at attracting, retaining, uh, retraining, and growing the workforce in Northern Virginia. With a master's degree in city planning from MIT and an honors degree from Dartmouth, he has held executive leadership ranks in real estate in both the public and private sectors. 
As deputy mayor of the District of Columbia, his team transformed Washington with projects such as City Center, The Wharf, and Union Market. His career has taken him from Wall Street to Main Street, and he has expanded economies from Los Angeles, Long Beach to the Mid-Atlantic region. Mr. Hoskins is frequently chosen for a list of the most influential business leaders in Virginia and the Washington area. He's a popular public speaker on economic development and leadership topics, and has been quoted in Fortune, Forbes, and the Washington Post. Victor, it's so good to see you again. Thank you for joining us again for this event. I know that we um, appreciate deeply your passion on this topic, your commitment, and, um, and how you are driving change in the region. So thank you for being here. It's my absolute pleasure, uh, Chair McKenna. I, and first of all, I, I wanna thank you for the, for the opportunity to be part of this, this, this group. I mean, uh, to be moderating this amazing panel um, is an absolute pleasure. Um, a lot of people do not realize that I have an extensive background in housing. As a matter of fact, um, the Deputy Secretary um, and, and I worked together in Washington, D.C. when I was Deputy Mayor um, for Economic Development in D.C. And, and at that time, I sat on her board and I saw her do some incredible um, work um, in public housing. And a lot of people are familiar with the fact that I actually grew up part of my life in public housing. Um, they hear about my background and they think one thing, but the reality is another. And I will tell you that the change um, in, in where we lived made all the difference. We moved into a working class neighborhood and it, and it transformed my life. And I think every opportunity that I've had. Um, I've been fortunate also uh, to have had the opportunity to work with an, an, all three of the four of our panelists. Um, you know, of course, I'm working with Chairman McKay right now. And by the way, what a brilliant leader, what a bold leader. I just love working with him. I, he was at this, this next 495 event the other day, and I, I was just inspired um, by his clarity on what you do to build an economy. You include everyone in that work. You provide for everyone in that environment. You build the infrastructure that companies need to grow. He understands what it takes. And that part of that infrastructure is housing. Um, you know, and I've been fortunate to work with even Catherine Buell. Catherine Buell was executive director of my St. Elizabeth's project when I was deputy mayor in DC. She did a brilliant job. She helped transform Ward 7 and 8 through that project. And, um, and I'm just so proud to, that what she's doing at, at, um, at Amazon, it just, it just warms my heart. Um, if I get a little emotional, I'm gonna apologize, but it, this is just a topic that really, really touches me in, in many ways. Um, we all know that the pandemic um, has had an incredible um, effect on people's housing. And as a matter of fact, from a health perspective, housing has been an unfortunate um, driver of, of COVID. Um, overcrowding in homes, um, you know, created spread of the disease, uh, premature, premature death, um, housing instability. Um, and then on the economic side, people not being able to go to work. A lot of them couldn't pay their rent. Um, they couldn't pay their mortgages. And it really created, uh, really put a spotlight on how important housing is in everyone's life. Um, as we recover in, in this pandemic, unfortunately, it, it hasn't been equal. And, and our panelists are gonna talk about that. The unequal um, results of, from of developing this housing. And, 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 when, and when we talk about affordable housing, we mean the range of affordable housing. We mean all the way down to SSI, which is people living on social security or disability, all the way up to workforce housing. I mean, that's the whole spectrum that they'll talk about. Um, and, and I mentioned how important um, housing was in my life and how it changed my life. Um, but there are studies out there that show um, that frankly, housing has a particularly strong effect on children. A stable home, a good neighborhood has a lifelong impact on the earnings and outcomes um, of those kids as they become adults. I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. There is a long tail to doing the right thing for housing and it's a positive tail. Um, and data shows that you know, economic mobility and economic growth are, you know, are, are, are strong in many jurisdictions across the nation. As a matter of fact, they ranked 145 jurisdictions across the nation and Fairfax County came out number two for economic mobility in, with all races. But when you, cut, when you go down to the granular level, there are still very, very pressing issues um, in, in the area of race, um, in the area of age. Um, that we need to provide for. And I know that Chairman McKay is, is leading that charge and I'm just proud to be you know, on his economic development team on the job creation side of that. Um, you know, we, we can um, talk about the issues of, of housing, but the most important thing for us to do is talk about the, the changes that we need to make 
to create more housing. Um, creating housing at scale is a, is a big challenge. Um, you know, I know Susan Dewey understands this challenge. She works across the state. Uh, Susan Dewey and I worked together when I was Secretary of Housing for the state of Maryland. Um, Susan Dewey and I worked together um, when she was uh, both serving um, as a housing finance agency director and I was the housing finance agency director. Um, I met her, I was impressed by her, again, clarity of her mission um, and ability to execute um, at scale. Uh, she understood things, frankly, that I didn't understand because I had just come off of Wall Street and, and I was really, um, really new to this part of housing. And, and I learned a lot from her and I know we're gonna learn a lot from her today. Um, and then we have Jonathan Knopf who's gonna really provide a lot of, a lot of insight on the research and, and what that says. And he does great storytelling through research and data. Um, and so I'm gonna just jump right into the panel. Um, I'm gonna start off with Chairman McKay. Um, you heard that he was born and raised in Fairfax County um, and, and he um, started with the lead district and he's now chair of the board. Um, I have to tell you, first of all, everyone needs to realize he is the chairman of the board of the largest jurisdiction in the Commonwealth. People forget that 1.2 million residents, the largest jurisdiction in this DC region. People forget that. That is huge responsibility, 15,000 employees. He has a weight on his shoulder that we do not understand. But even with that, he's created one of, he and his colleagues and the colleagues before them uh, created one of the safest environments, actually the safest county in the country. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chairman McKay for his remarks. Chairman McKay. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Victor. And um, what, what a spectacular uh, introduction. And, and I wanna thank you for, for your passion as well. Um, you know, economic development sometimes has been divorced from affordable housing. And the, the key that Victor knows is the two are intertwined. Um, they must exist together for both of them to be successful. And we can't forget about the importance of affordable housing with the importance of economic development for a community. And Victor in the EDA uh, really gets that. And so I am, I am really pleased uh, to be on this panel today. Uh, Victor mentioned, you know, where, where I came from. Uh, come from the Route 1 corridor. That's where I was born and raised. And, you know, it, it, it really has changed the way I think about so many things in Fairfax County. And, and that's one of the things that, that I'm very proud of. Uh, growing up, I had a great childhood um, in Route 1. And, you know, what I didn't realize at the time uh, was that there were many other opportunities and assets and things that existed in other parts of the county uh, that we didn't have in the Route 1 corridor. And I never knew that. Um, until I got much older and, and more experienced and saw the opportunities that existed in other pockets, pockets of the county. And it really drives my equity work because, you know, we are Fairfax County, as Victor said, we're the largest county in Virginia. Uh, we have tremendous assets, opportunities, services, but they're not always equitably distributed. And we need to do a much better job in focusing on equity and uplifting all corners of the county. And it really was a driver behind the one Fairfax policy. It was my experiences growing up. It was Supervisor Hudgens at the time, uh, his experiences. And the two of us collaborated on a one Fairfax policy that now guides all of our work in Fairfax that is focused on equity. Uh, and it is so important uh, that we do that because if we're gonna move the needle on affordable housing, we have to understand where the needs are, but we also have to understand where the opportunities are. And the opportunities might not always be in the same places that they've been in the past. And so one of the things I'm most proud of in Fairfax is that not only just our numbers that I mentioned preliminarily a few minutes ago, but I'm really, really proud of the fact that we are building housing in every corner of the county, literally. If you map it out and look, there are areas of the county that have lacked affordable housing for a long, long time. And we've broken the ice uh, to get into those communities and make sure that we're distributing affordable housing equitably for opportunity for the residents of that housing. You know, people need to be near resources. They need to be near transit. They need to be near high quality jobs so that they can bootstrap their way up. Um, and, and into the middle class. And, and really that's a goal that, you know, all of our uh, residents in Fairfax County share uh, with people who need affordable housing. I mean, we want them to succeed. We want to give them the resources to succeed. And sometimes where we put that housing um, and how we talk about affordable housing is integral uh, in, making that, in, in making that happen. And so I know, you know, the point of this discussion is equitable economic growth. And, and I can tell you that we're making that happen 
uh, here in Fairfax, but it's not always easy. Um, you know, um, Jerry, Jerry Connolly's um, uh, assistant earlier was talking about uh, one Fairfax and, or one university and, and how in the one university project, we still had people who were very much opposed uh, to that affordable housing. And so, you know, I understand the politics of this enough to know that sometimes these aren't the most popular decisions. Uh, but we, if we are going to achieve real equitable economic growth, we have to lead by example. We have to push the needle. We have to remind people what affordable housing does for the overall economy, why it benefits each and every one of us, why it needs to be in every corner of the county. We have to be the ones to, to make that point uh, because the politics is not always easy. Uh, we know we're going to have people opposed, um, but in the name of equitable growth, uh, we have to be building a better community for future generations and the decisions that we make um, are doing that. Uh, you know, I'm going to close with, um, you know, just a, an experience that I had with Oakwood. I mentioned Oakwood earlier in the Lee District. And when I was still Lee District supervisor, uh, we worked on finding available land, vacant land that was underutilized. And we, we stumbled upon a stormwater management pond and we said, hey, you know, this is a, a couple blocks from the Van Dorn Metro Station. Uh, right next to the beltway for access you know why is this site not being used higher and better use why can't we underground components of the stormwater and use this land for affordable housing and once we decided that we were going to head down that path before we had our first citizen meeting i had a petition on my desk from a couple hundred residents that said stop the low income housing and crime coming to our community and so we stood up a task force of our nonprofit partners, uh, which in that case was Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing with the community, with HCD, and with the opposition uh, to, to this proposed project. We talked through the assets. We showed them the quality of what affordable housing could look like, the need in the county. Um, and they quickly realized when we also showed them the incomes you needed. These are hardworking people that just need affordable housing. We showed them the incomes. Many of these people who had lived in the county and bought their houses in the 1960s and 70s were surprised to learn that they would be qualified uh, to live in this community that they were fighting. And so we have to change the optic for people and the way we describe this. We overcame uh, all that opposition and I'm proud to say that site is under construction today, but we overcame it by putting real faces and real people uh, in, in these affordable units so that people could see the type of people that we were helping. They could see the high quality of the type of project we were building, and they could see the incomes that were still necessary to qualify uh, for these units. These are people not that aren't working. These are people who are working and working hard and trying to be successful in Fairfax County. So if we are going to make equitable growth happen uh, in our region, we have to all work together to change the description of what affordable housing is to overcome the political barriers to make these projects happen, but more importantly, uh, to build the community support for affordable housing. I often tell folks that the last development we built is the best advertisement for the entitlements for the next one. And that's why quality is also so important to quantity if we're going to continue to tackle to tackle this issue. And so great to be with you. Uh, proud to be on this panel and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Victor. Thank you so much, Chairman McKay. And I love what you just said about about quality. Um, I remember an experience when I was um, when I was Secretary of Housing and we had we had done a ton of we did about 30,000 units while I was there across the state and it was not easy. And I remember uh, someone very political came up to me and said, why would you want to build housing so lovely for poor people? And, and, and I, this is what I told them. I will not be involved in building a housing unit that I would not want to put my mother in. Now, that should be your floor. You know, you don't want to put your mother in a place that looks like a dump. You know, you just said it, quality. And that quality speaks to what you're doing for people because that transforms their lives. Design matters and people a lot of times forget that. So thank you so much for, for that, Chairman McKay. Um, our, our next panelist is, is a dear friend, uh, Catherine Buell. Catherine Buell and I worked together uh, in DC when I was deputy mayor. Um, she did a phenomenal job on St. Elizabeth. I hand her this project, I say, uh, she's an attorney, she's coming out of this highfalutin firm. And I say, well, I got this 200 acre project down in Ward 8. <laughs> 
And she goes, I live in Ward 8. That's fantastic. And she was so excited about it. But she took this on. And, and I have to tell you, talk about design matters. She helped build this beautiful pavilion that served as the centerpiece for really transforming that environment. And now I, I could probably say she works for Amazon, running the $2 billion <laughs> equity fund, providing thousands of units, not just here in DC, but also in Nashville and also on the West Coast. Um, Catherine, I, I, I'm so proud of you. Um, I'll give you the floor. Please Thank take. you so much. And I actually, this morning, I got to drive through St. Elizabeth's East. And for those who haven't seen it, it is a real place. It is magical. It has a million square feet of historic buildings. So if you are a preservationist like I am, it is the place to be. It's a little unreal. Um, but thank you, Victor. And thank you for your leadership and all that you do. Um, I will say as a Washingtonian, I was so excited to hear that Amazon was coming. And I do pinch myself regularly that I get to do this work on behalf of Amazon. So thank you so much. Um, as Victor mentioned, my name is Catherine Buell, and I am the director for the Amazon Housing Equity Fund and very excited to be here today. For those who have not heard of the Amazon Housing Equity Fund, it is our two plus billion dollar commitment to creating or preserving 20,000 affordable housing units in three of our hometown communities here in Arlington, Virginia, and the Washington, D.C. area, which includes Fairfax, Nashville, Tennessee, as well as the Puget Sound. And earlier this week, we had the distinct pleasure of releasing our year-to-date impact report, which shows that we have invested or committed over $1.2 billion to creating or preserving over 5,800 affordable housing units. And just to talk specifically about the kinds of investments that we're making, um, we've been making investments in preservation of affordability because as we know, while the capital region needs close to 360,000 new units in all of the counties, Fairfax County, Washington, D.C., Arlington, Virginia are all going to have to pitch in. And it's so exciting to hear that Fairfax is doubling its affordable housing commitment to help us get to that regional goal. Um, we've been able to make sure that the hole in our boat, um, as I like to call it, um, gets filled. And then we're not losing preservation as quickly as we have been. Um, this includes investments in Huntington City Side that we made with Lincoln Avenue Capital to preserve over 500 plus units of housing as affordable in Fairfax County. Um, we've also invested in projects like Crystal House and the Barcroft in Arlington, Virginia. Um, those two projects have actually increased the level of affordable housing in Arlington, Virginia alone by 22% in one year. These are meaningful investments. Earlier this week, we were able to announce that we were also committing another $124 million um, as part of our transit commitment. Our first two transit projects were announced, which were in New Carrollton and College Park, both in Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, New Carrollton is particularly exciting because it is a regional hub um, that gives you access to not only the Purple Line, but Amtrak um, and the Mark. And given the continued efforts to uh, invest in transportation, including the expansion of Long Bridge, we expect that that regional transit um, service across the MARC system, across the VRE system, is really going to open up the region in a major way. Um, we've also been able to partner with COG to invest in the planning efforts by local governments to create more affordable housing near transit. Um, and finally, I would be remiss to mention that as we talk about housing equity, we've been investing alongside a diverse and minority um, developers making sure that um, we're not only benefiting people of color in our investments, because we do know that they are disproportion disproportionately in need of housing that they can afford, um, but also making sure that the partners that we're working with are diverse partners. In December of last year, we announced that we are investing $21 million in what we're calling an accelerator program. And I will briefly talk about what that program is. We wanted to invest in early stage capital for minority developers um, to help accelerate their affordable housing projects. We're providing mentorship and training through the Capital Impact Partners, which is based in Arlington, Virginia. Um, they will shortly be announcing their cohort participants. Um, and these are small emerging firms that are looking to do more affordable housing. For us, this is particularly important because we know that those firms are also local homegrown firms who will carry out the mission and the vision of affordable housing over the long term. 
Um, as we continue this year, we'll be looking for more partnerships in affordable housing. Um, we look forward to partnering with local governments. We recognize that local governments are the primary steward of affordable housing issues and have been working on um, affordable housing for some time. Um, federal governments, and it's, it was great to hear what Deputy Secretary Todman had to say about all of the investments that HUD is making in affordable housing. Um, but we stand as a private sector partner here to support and here to do what we can to advance affordable housing as quickly as possible. So it's a real pleasure to be here today among such superstars in Fairfax County um, and in the state of Virginia generally. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your support of the Amazon Housing Equity Fund. And we have so many more exciting announcements coming down the pipeline um, that we will be sharing shortly. So um, thank you so much for having us today. Listen, Catherine, we're, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I, I have to say, you know, for a Patton Boggs, former attorney, you know, <laughs> former, you know, investment counselor, uh, you really have doing a great job um, in, in affordable housing. And we really appreciate it in every market that you're working in. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. You're welcome. I wanted to take a minute to, to mention some of the people who do the blocking ta and tackling in this work. Um, you know, people like Thomas Fleetwood and his team, uh, they have just done a spectacular job um, at, at the housing authority and and they really work every day uh, to be creative. I've actually talked to them about you know, about investors from around the country. I've brought developers to them um, and every time they work at trying to get something done and and that and really they do the they do the hard blocking and tackling every day. And I just wanted to give you know a shout out to to him and his team uh, and also to, to County Executive Hill um, who has just done a yeoman's job. Um, in, in balancing all of these issues. I cannot believe the way he's, you know, he and the, and the Board of Supervisors have worked through this, this issue of COVID across the county um, and have not stopped. Housing did not get put on the back burner. Economic development did not, put, did not get put on the back burner. Nothing got put on the back burner. And that is what's so incredibly spectacular about this to see, you know, the, the executive work so closely with the electeds, um, and, and the rest of the team, the 15,000 people that work every day in the county, it, it's just, it's just a, a marvel to see. Um, and, and now let me just take a moment to introduce uh, Susan Dewey. Um, a lot of people know Susan Dewey as the CEO of Virginia Housing, and, and I do too. Uh, but before that, she was, actually, she was actually the treasurer of the state of Virginia. A lot of people aren't familiar with that. She has a very powerful background in finance and accounting. Um, and, and when I first met her, I have to tell you, she totally blew me away. I mean, she, she doesn't remember this, but I sat there with my mouth open for probably five minutes. I probably looked like some goofy kid, but I was just absorbing her knowledge. She knows so much about the industry and how you actually get these complicated deals done. You have the 9% tax credits, you have the 4% tax credits, you have local grants, you have statewide grants, you have philanthropic um, infusions, you have people donating land. It could not get more complicated, but worse than that, she also is dealing with rural. She's dealing with exurban. She's dealing with suburban and urban all at the same time. So uh, I have to say they could not have found a better person. Um, you have just done an amazing um, job. I'm proud um, that you are our, uh, our CEO of Virginia Housing. And let me turn it the floor over to you, Susan. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, I, you um, are incredible also. And boy, let me tell you, how excited I am to have somebody that has both an economic and a housing background in your position. Because what we've been trying to say for years is how important that intersection between housing and economic development truly is. I mean, and kudos to Amazon for being um, a private sector partner that said when they were looking at Northern Virginia, if we're gonna come, what are you gonna do about housing and the high cost you see in that area? And um, that has really paved the way, I think, for more extensive conversations and showing that important link between our uh, businesses that are looking to locate in Virginia, but say, where are people gonna live? And um, so I thank you for all the, the work you've been doing and for being a partner with us on this journey. I wanna thank everybody who's already spoken today. Wow, I've been blown away, you know, and it does, you know, one of the things that Virginia Housing that we um, like to talk about is partnerships. And I think today just goes to show how important those par partnerships are between certainly the federal government. Um, and I wanted to say how important um, Congressman Connolly has been to our efforts 
for many, many years, and the deputy secretary was there. You've got universities, private sector with Amazon, and of course, our local partners are really key to all that we want to achieve with our housing mission, and Fairfax is a great example of that, both in terms of the county leadership, um, you in economic development, um, Tom Fleetwood with the um, Redevelopment Housing Authority. We really appreciate it. And you know, um, Virginia housing is a little uniquely structured. I'm not sure everybody knows. We used to be called VHDA, but we wanted to rebrand ourselves so people knew all we're focusing on really is housing. And that's why we're Virginia housing. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary. We do what we do without any state taxpayer dollars because we operate um, very much like a private sector lender. At the end of the day, our money all goes back into a program called REACH where we try to um, go even further in meeting the targeted housing needs across the Commonwealth. And, you know, we talk a lot about COVID and we're hoping we're pulling out of that now, but one of the things that I think it has served to do, and that is to bring uh, the spotlight to how important housing is. You hear a lot safer at home, but how can you be safer at home if your home is not safe? How can you also, focus on education, you or your children, jobs, health, all of those things if you do not have a safe home. So that's why we're very focused on creating with our partners, healthy, prosperous communities. Um, we're fortunate that we've been working with some of the federal relief programs, both rent relief and um, now mortgage assistance program to help um, really reach out to those most vulnerable and most affected by the COVID environment to keep them moving forward and, and keep their homes in place. One of the things we like to focus on is really that continuum of, of opportunity. So we start with our, our most vulnerable citizens with um, public housing residents and those that are on vouchers. So we appreciate the additional vouchers that Deputy Secretary Todman mentioned. Um, we, we really do need those vouchers for many of our um, lowest income um, residents. But then we go to our low income housing tax credit program, which is vitally important. And I know Fairfax understands that because we work with you quite a bit um, in allocation of those important tax credits. So if you're talking to your congressman, please tell them that we're gonna need more tax credits to accomplish some of the goals that we've already talked about today. And then we um, really do a lot with our um, rental programs and a mixed use, mixed income program, which is, I think, phenomenal to really say, if you're going to do market rate housing, how can we also bring in some affordable housing and um, not try to concentrate housing, but to show that mix of income. And then our first time home buyer um, program, where we combine our free down payment assistance grants with our um, uh, free home ownership education. We're really trying to close that gap with minority home ownership. And um, right now, as many of you know, the biggest issue we're facing, no matter what type of home ownership you're looking for, is the supply issue. And that's both in home ownership and rental. What can we do to really try to make a difference in um, uh, that supply? Because the demand far surpasses the um, supply of affordable housing. We um, wanted to go back just quickly, and again, thank you for your help with Amazon. What we did at Virginia Housing is we did put up an additional 75 million commitment, and we had a task force, including you, Victor, Tom Fleetwood was on it, and others, um, to really determine what we could do to add more money to leverage the good work that was doing in affordable housing. And we're pleased that we've been able uh, to select 21 projects, and that represents more than 2,000 units. Um, and it is including the landings one at Mount Vernon and the landings two at Fort Belvoir. Um, it's, it's really important that we work together to try to figure out where these types of resources are um, going to be most important. That's why we also have something called a community impact grant. And that starts at the very beginning of the process because you know, planning is important. And when localities recognize a need, like you heard um, Chairman 
Kay talk about is how important it was that um, we get to those 10,000 units. And by the way, we want to be a partner as we have been with the 2,000 units in achieving your success with the 10,000 units. But to do that, we have to start at the beginning. And so we um, have community impact grants that help. One of them was real important in uh, working with the community, the residents of Harmony Place Mobile Home Park in Fairfax. And you know, some of my, our most vulnerable citizens live in mobile home parks, not only in Fairfax, but across the Commonwealth of Virginia. And now that that land is so incredibly valuable, owners are looking to sell it and where are they gonna go? Um, an important issue and we wanted to get in on the planning phase of that so that we can help as best we can. And the other end of that, we're working with Fairfax County um, through a program called SPARK, awarding 10 million this year to help reduce the interest rate on their affordable home ownership program. And then um, we have two really cool programs are working with the Fairfax to utilize county owned land. So thank you, Fairfax. Land is so valuable but to advance home ownership development opportunities um, and also to assist manufactured housing. I think that's manufactured housing is gonna be very important in our future. Um, one of the things I wanted to also mention as I start to wrap up though, is the need for regional cooperation. And we see that in Northern Virginia. We don't see that in all other areas and all other regions of the Commonwealth, but we appreciate, we have a. Northern Virginia Task Force and work with many of you on uh, looking at the regional needs that you have. But we just launched a 40 million grant program to go to Virginia's planning district commissions. There are 21 of them. And the idea was to really jumpstart that regional conversation about housing and how important that is. So we uh, are working with the Northern Virginia Regional Commission that's just announced a new home ownership initiative with Habitat for Humanity in Northern Virginia. And that's one of five new affordable housing investments in that region through this PDC initiative. So it really is a continuum of effort that we have um, all income levels. You know, I tell you workforce housing, as you know, Victor is very important because if you're gonna bring new businesses into your jurisdiction, you've got to know where um, the housing is gonna be made available. So I'm joined today by, we have a team in Northern Virginia that's uh, really focused. Jill Norcross I know is on this call as is the rest of our team, but we are really here to be your partners and to make your goals come true. Well, wow, thank you so much, Susan. It really, uh, first of all, thank you for the, the, the discussion about the, the programs, but also your emphasis on the region itself and the cooperation of the region. You know, we really have uh, just learned uh, in economic development just recently, I mean, it's only been a few years now that we created the Northern Virginia Economic Development Alliance. And you probably, you know, have heard a little bit about us, but it has really made a big difference um, and us looking at our problems regionally. And I have to tell you, uh, Chairman McKay um, and the Board of Supervisors have been so encouraging um, from the moment I, I took the job, that was one of the first things that they told me. And you telling me that it's also an opportunity to gain more resources for housing, exactly what we need to hear. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you, so, Victor. Oh, you're, you're quite welcome. So our, our next our next speaker um, is is Jonathan Knopf, and Jonathan has an, an incredible uh, background. You know, he has a master's in city planning, um, and he really focuses on data. And a, a lot of people don't have an appreciation for data, but I'm one of those people that do. I love to understand things through data because they can reveal insights and help you create innovations um, that you can't normally see if you don't have a data set. Um, and, and what he does is what I, I love. I read your bio, man. I couldn't believe it. I love the way they said this, that you tell stories through data. And Jonathan, not everyone can do that. A lot of people generate confusion through data. So, so if you can tell a story through data, you have actually jumped a big hurdle. Um, with that, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you so much, Victor. It's really fantastic to be here this morning. I um, want to thank um, all the other speakers that have spoken so far, Chairman McKay, Catherine and Susan, who are just some really great leaders. I really feel like I'm punching above my weight 
this morning. So um, the invite is greatly appreciated. And um, I do not want to forget to thank uh, Melissa and other folks at the Housing Authority and the county, particularly Linda and her team for helping um, forge this event and bring it together virtually. Um, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. I know I've done these events before, so I just want to make sure uh, the staff and folks on the back end um, have my appreciation. So um, most of you are probably familiar with Housing Forward Virginia. We've been around since 2004. We are a nonprofit that is Virginia's go-to resource for everything affordable housing. And we were founded really to address an increasing need to equip experts and the public alike with high quality research, um, education and training about different trends and best practices and policy solutions that are proven and work um, to help expand housing affordability throughout the Commonwealth. And in fact, today we are well represented at this event. Um, Susan Dewey has been on our board for a very long time. She's been a really great leader for our organization. Uh, we also have Lisa Sturdivant who will be speaking later today about the home ownership gap. Um, she joined our board last year. And so our board and our leadership has been really, really great in making sure we take advantage of opportunities to get the word out about affordable housing and to help people on the ground across the Commonwealth to actually do the work are in the trenches and get affordable housing built. So I know we probably have a lot of great questions and discussion that we wanna reserve time for. So I'd just like to make four brief points in my remarks this morning that um, came to mind for me when I heard the topic of, um, of this session. So the first of those is that housing is absolutely integral to Virginia's economy. We know that every worker in Virginia and obviously every Virginian needs a home to be safe and secure and successful. So that means the location where that home is, the availability, how easy it is to access that home, and the cost of that home, how much you have to pay for it, all impact the ability for that worker and that family or that household to save, to build wealth, and to contribute to overall economic growth in their community. So housing is so foundational. We also know that Virginia's housing industry overall accounted for more than $28 billion in direct economic output in 2015. Um, that was based uh, from a 2017 report by the Governor's Housing Policy um, Advisory Council. And so that number has likely increased, pandemic notwithstanding, um, in the past five or six years. And that actually makes housing the sixth largest private sector industry in the Commonwealth. So housing is right up there, um, creating lots of jobs, sustaining lots of jobs, and helping support economic growth across um, all parts of the state. Um, and those jobs, and there's over 300,000 of them involved in our housing industry, are good paying positions. Um, the industry supported over $14 billion in wages in 2015, according to that HPAC study. And I looked up just this morning, the average wage for construction jobs in the DC metro area is $25 an hour. Um, so these are good paying jobs to help build housing that our neighbors and our communities need. Um, so all of that means any efforts to make housing more affordable, more equitable, and more accessible are going to have beneficial downstream effects for the people that get into that housing, but every community that that housing is built in. So housing is so, so important. Um, the second point, which other speakers have, um, have highlighted and I think is, is really critical to understand, is that the pandemic, this, this COVID um, uh, situation that we've been in for two years now, has not just revealed, but also amplified existing inequalities and inequities in our housing system overall. As Susan and others have said, it showed the importance and necessity of stable housing. And we also saw the clear connection between workers with lower wages, folks who work in retail, food service, other sectors that really serve as the daily backbone of our economies across pretty much every part of our Commonwealth. Um, they were more commonly out of work because they are on the front lines interacting in person um, with people and they were the first ones to have their positions cut or furloughed in the pandemic. And so that greatly impacted their ability to stay in their home and to retain secure housing throughout all of COVID. Um, and we should remember, Victor, like you mentioned earlier, that research during the pandemic has showed that overcrowding, not density of a community, but overcrowding within particular households has been one of the primary drivers of the spread of COVID. 
And overcrowding, when we look at the data across Virginia, and this is true for across the country, um, more significantly impacts uh, Virginians of, that have lower wages and especially Virginians of color. So that is a tremendous equity issue. The third thing is that um, the housing market data over the, the course of the pandemic is reinforcing these challenges. Unfortunately, the, we're not seeing a really great story in the data right now. The median home price in Fairfax County increased by almost 9%, 8.7% from the beginning of 2020, right before the pandemic, to the end of last year. So it's about $600,000 to buy the average home in Fairfax County right now. Median rent, likewise, in the county has increased by 8.3% over that same time period. And the average apartment is now close to $2,000 a month in the county. Over that same time span, the average wage in Fairfax County decreased 3.6%. So those are two trends that we do not want to see sustained um, that significantly for a long period of time, because we know what the consequences of inaction are going to be. And so finally, the last point that I'd like to make is hopefully on a more positive note, um, because we still have many reasons to be hopeful for, um, for progress on these issues. Today in Virginia, we have record investments in housing affordability initiatives. These include the Virginia Housing Trust Fund, which has increased in funding exponentially over the past 10 to 12 years and is expected to have another historical investment in the upcoming budget from the General Assembly. Susan mentioned the REACH funding from Virginia Housing, which supports a really diverse range of different housing investments, both in actual units and in the providers that create housing to make sure they have the tools and information and capacity they have to get done what we need to get done in our housing sector. We have a new Virginia Housing Opportunity Tax Credit to work in conjunction with the federal low-income housing tax credit. Um, so Virginia has now um, joined the uh, elite group of states that have a state companion tax credit across the country, which is very encouraging to see and will help create more affordable units across the whole state. Um, and we also have a brand new housing innovations and energy efficiency fund at DHCD to help bring really innovative energy efficiency measures to new and existing affordable housing across the state. That work is funded by the proceeds of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative uh, carbon auctions um, that first took place last year when Virginia uh, joined REGI. Um, so we should be confident also in Virginia's housing agencies, Virginia Housing, DHCD, and many of our local governments like Fairfax County, um, who, and uh, because they have set up over the course of the pandemic and run a very successful emergency rent and mortgage relief program. Um, this is probably the highest performing program um, in the entire nation. The amount of money that these agencies have gotten out into the hands of Virginians who need it to help pay rent and to make their budgets whole has been remarkable. To see that program stand up in such a quick time and to see that money get out so efficiently, I think should give us a lot of hope. And that um, success was reinforced when we asked um, providers across the Commonwealth to interact with our state housing agencies in these programs, um, what they think. Um, we did a big statewide study recently, which I think we'll dive into a little bit more in the questions um, from uh, House Bill 854 in 2020. And we heard from providers that they are confident in our state and our state housing practitioners to help them increase the supply of affordable housing and get their jobs done. So um, we also have proof today that localities um, and regions are eager for knowledge and for solutions to their housing challenges. Across Virginia, we have a lot of the same housing challenges. We also have some unique things that are very specific to different communities. Um, and so our team here at Housing Forward um, is helping address those issues, try to answer those questions with data, with research, with best practices, um, and believe it or not, uh, Victor, as you alluded to, we are seeing more regional cooperation across the state on housing, um, which is very um, surprising, I think, to see in many ways, because we know that, um, unfortunately, one of the reasons why we don't have regional cooperation across the state sometimes is because of the, the nature of our, of our neighborhoods and the changing demographics of those, 
from earlier in the 20th century that led to white flight and other challenges that we're um, still dealing with today. And so using housing as a way to um, share common challenges and common resources across different regions is really encouraging to see in Virginia. And that's not just happening in Northern Virginia, it's happening here in the Richmond region, in the New River Valley, in Hampton Roads, it's happening across the state. And so I think there's lots of reasons to be hopeful. So finally, we know our challenges and we've been through a lot of them over the past two years to be sure. Um, but we also will know a lot of the solutions that we need to fix things. Um, while it's exciting to see a lot of really interesting, innovative solutions um, over the past couple of years, and we've been involved in a lot of those, um, a lot of this stuff isn't rocket science. Building housing is not that complex at the end of the day. Um, so we have a chance really in Virginia to uh, use housing to make sure that all of our neighbors, all Virginians thrive for decades to come. Um, and I hope we can do that. And I think today um, it is proof that we are on the right track. So Victor, I'll hand it back over to you. Jonathan, thank you so much. I have to say that your words were very encouraging uh, on the side of regionalism. I, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that because it's something that you know I perceived and I think a lot of us perceive, but actually to hear someone who is involved in the research to say it is, is very powerful. The second thing I wanna say is that your, the information on resources that are available to actually attack the problem, to actually deal with the problem is so important. Um, yeah, the problem is daunting. Yes, it's, it's complicated. Yes, it's hard. But when you have resources, that means you can actually do something about it. And, and, and the last thing I want to say is that, that your, your, your mentioning of, of, of shared, you know, I always think of shared sacrifice and shared prosperity. It's one of the things that a lot of people, um, you know, particularly if you've been brought up in an environment where you've never had to share. I had five brothers and sisters. So there were six of us. Everything was shared. Clothes were shared, shoes were shared, everything was shared. Um, so, so sharing is very natural uh, for me, but, but, to, but for communities is sometimes complicated by some of the things that you said, the dem demographic changes and all these shifts. You know, it, the data does, does support the fact that we are headed in the right direction. And, and I'm glad to hear that. Um, so now we're going to go to um, um, open for questions. I'm going to I'm going to go through a series of questions with our panelists, and I'm, I'm going to start off with Chairman McKay. Um, you know, Chairman McKay, look, largest jurisdiction in the Commonwealth. Um, you have to just by that you have the most problems. I mean, it just it just is. Um, you have not turned away from housing, which is always, a, it's, it's like the third rail. It's like the train is, you know, it's like the train is there, you know, the metro's there, and there's this third rail that you don't want to touch. Um, but you you and, and really the Board of Supervisors have just gone straight into it and attacked it, you know, working with the housing authority. You set a goal of a floor of 5,000. Now you're going to raise that floor to 10,000. What, why, why is why is that possible in this jurisdiction? Why, how, how is that possible? Because this is a complicated place. How do you do it? Well, you know, I, I think, uh, Victor, we do it a couple ways. And the reason it's possible is in part related to some of the things that some of the other speakers have said. Um, you know, we set out on a mission to make affordable housing a board priority. This board did uh, from day one when we were sworn into office in 2020. Uh, two months, two and a half months later, uh, I was standing at a press conference where we were announcing our first COVID case in the city of Fairfax. And so um, I think what that did was it actually hit the accelerator uh, on our affordable housing goals because it was no longer, you know, it's great for economic development, it's morally the right thing to do. It became imperative, a life and safety issue uh, for so many people in our community. And we saw the disparities that, that Jonathan and other people highlighted early on in the pandemic. Uh, with infections and, and deaths and some of the things that were happening in our community and the resolve to make affordable housing not just a, a, an economic issue and a moral issue, uh, but it really became a health issue uh, very quickly. And so I think that helped hit the accelerator. I think, frankly, um, our community in Fairfax, uh, by and large, thinks about affordable housing differently today than we did before the pandemic. You know, I always remind uh, my constituents that while some of us, uh, myself doesn't fall into this category, by the way, uh, but while some of us were able to, you know, mostly work from home safely throughout the pandemic, uh, there were a lot of people that didn't have that luxury and they kept our economy going. 
These were the people delivering goods and services, home health care workers, uh, grocery store workers, the people who were out in our economy literally contributing to and supporting the livelihood of all of the county. And those are the people, unfortunately, are working in jobs that need affordable housing the most. And so they were our, our heroes uh, through the pandemic. Certainly our healthcare workers, our first responders, military folks, always heroes, but there was this new class of heroes that entered our environment. Um, and it was, you know, for some people, uh, just being able to go in a grocery store uh, was a victory, but imagine uh, if there was no clerk at the register to check out your groceries, um, you know, it would have been a, a very big problem uh, in the county. And so I think the mindset has shifted. Um, but, you know, I also want to emphasize that, you know, to, to deal with the affordable housing issue and to move that number for us is one piece of our puzzle. Uh, building new affordable housing is one piece. We have to look hard at our policies and communities, too, if we are to really move the needle. And so I think our one Fairfax policy has been tremendously helpful yep. by intentionally forcing all of us to look at equity and all the decisions that we make. It was a driver when we rewrote our zoning ordinance, for example. Uh, this didn't get a lot of attention, um, got a lot of opposition. Uh, but didn't get a lot of attention from folks that when we rewrote our zoning ordinance to allow accessory living units within single family houses, uh, we moved the needle tremendously by sending a message to our community that for the environment, for the economy, for our urgent housing needs, uh, people being able to have another family or another individual live in unused parts of their home safely by permit is something that not only can help people keep their homes, especially our, our seniors who have oversized houses and, and don't wanna move, have high utility bills, have basements that they haven't even walked into, um, that we can use that space to provide affordable housing in a way that can be incorporated into a community smartly, but can dramatically increase the amount of affordable housing in a community. And so we've looked internally at our own policies things like our zoning ordinance, and also, you know, obviously hit the accelerator on building the number of units. But the way you do that and the way we've done it is, one, changing the dynamic and the optics of what affordable housing is. I mentioned this earlier uh, by putting real people, faces, names, professions in these affordable units and changing people's false perception about what affordable housing is. I mentioned earlier building quality. You know, every time we embark on building a new affordable uh, housing community, we want that to be the uh, advertisement for the next, the next one that's coming through yeah. the pipeline. And so when people say, you know, affordable housing, the negative things about it, we want to take them on a tour of what our affordable housing in Fairfax County looks like. Um, and so that's an important part of this. And then, and then lastly, I will say, and this is one that, you know, certainly uh, make some folks uncomfortable, but we also have to look at our, what I would consider to be market rate, unregulated affordable housing, and make sure that we are holding those landlords and owners accountable for conditions. You know, many of the, the communities that we have in Fairfax, you know, there are folks warehoused um, in not great living conditions because they're market rate affordable apartments where there's no reinvestment happening. And one of the things I think we have to hit the accelerator on is working with those owners uh, to make meaningful investments, put amenities in place, bring those units up to today's environmental standards, cut utility costs and, and you know, deal with the climate changes component of that, but also improve the quality of this older stock of housing. Because many people, when they think of affordable housing, think of the worst condition community they know of. And that's the marker they have for what right. for what affordable housing is. And so we really need to work with our landlords, owners of older housing stocks, some of the apartments built in the 1950s and 60s, and see how we can upgrade those units in partnership with them, because those are the ones that, frankly, are, 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 are unfortunately uh, reinforcing a false optic about what affordable housing can be and what it can look like and how it can contribute to our economy. And so I think all of those things combined um, are necessary, but you know, we're, we're moving the needle forward in part because of COVID, in part because of the political will of this board, uh, but also because our community uh, is thinking about affordable housing in a different way than they ever have before. Um, and that's very helpful.
Yeah. You know, I have to say that, you know, those are great lessons. And if you're a policymaker and you're on this call right now, I hope you're taking notes because those are great lessons. That one Fairfax approach that making it part of a policy is so essential. Um, I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to the private sector and, and ask Catherine a, a, a couple of, a, just first, let me just, with one opening question. Okay, Amazon, I remember this. I'm sitting down with John Schottler, global real estate for Amazon and, and Holly Sullivan, global economic development. I'm talking to them and, and we're about to, you know, get to the end of this deal. And they said, you know, we're going to really do something special about housing because we've been in Arlington. This is a small community. We're afraid. Um, and, 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 I, and I said, okay. We're going to trust you. And oh my God, $2 billion fund. I mean, look, they did it. What half a billion was uh, Microsoft, 600 million Google, 2 billion. Okay. How did you guys swing that? I mean, that's, I mean, asking Jeff for $2 billion for housing, that was a big deal. You got to explain that to us. <laughs> Well, I will say we have some giants in Amazon who are true believers. Um, John Shuttler is one of them. John actually um, created Mary's Place. It's a 200 bed homeless shelter on our main campus in Seattle. Um, and John was a leader. He took a risk. He sent Jeff Bezos an email and said, this is what I plan to do with one of our empty buildings. And he literally had Amazon put our money where our mouth is. Um, and I will say John is one of our unsung heroes for the housing equity fund being in existence. But also little known fact is that our treasure his wife is an affordable housing developer. And if you are an affordable housing developer, you are an advocate at your core. You don't shut off. And I am sure that every night over dinner, she reminded him what low cost capital will do for an affordable housing deal. So we have titans within Amazon who are true believers um, and really believe in using the power of Amazon um, and the power of our purse. We're extending our low cost of borrowing in addition to giving capital grants to make the affordable housing possible. So we're essentially operating as a gap funder. Um, the work that Susan does, the work that other affordable housing finance agencies do, whether it's Fannie or Freddie Mac, which is in Fairfax County, to come in and finance affordable housing makes all the difference in the world. We come in, but we know that there's always a gap. There's always some additional money always. that's needed to make these projects possible. Um, and so we come in and we fill that gap with low cost financing. That's part of the reason why we've been able to move so quickly with Metro. Um, little known fact that Metro has been selecting joint development partners who want to build affordable housing for some time. And they actually had a long list of development partners of plans, but that couldn't figure out how to fill that gap, exactly. how to make it possible. And that's why we're able to move at speed and at scale. Wow. I got to tell you, I, look, and, and a lot of your workers, let's just get, get clear here. A lot of your workers um, we're delivering those meals, as Jeff McKay said, That's right. you know, a lot of your workers were, were shopping in the stores for groceries. Um, this must have been something also for the rank and file that was very important uh, to make sure that that sufficient housing was available and affordable, because I know you guys have been focusing a lot on preservation. It is. It is. It's important for our workers. It's important for the workers in the region because what happens when an Amazon comes to a region, it's not just all of the people that Amazon hires, but it's all of those people that Amazon works with that hire additional people. We have an exponential effect. And we also know that all of those jobs are not going to be over $150,000. The majority of those jobs are going to be everyday average working people yeah. who now have real opportunity. Um, but because of the Housing Equity Fund, we can stop the drive until you qualify. One of the things that you'll notice about the Housing Equity Fund is we're putting housing where people want to live, Fairfax County and Huntington City side. That's where people want to live. They want to live near one of the largest job centers in our region, which is called Fairfax County and Tyson's Corner. Um, um, being able to be able to make sure that everyday workers have access to not only those job centers, but can live in close proximity and not have to spend an hour and a half on the road makes all the difference in the world. Wow. But, well, I'm going to shift gears now and go to the state level uh, because I know that Susan had worked on this HB 854 housing study and also worked with us here in Northern Virginia in economic development and what we could do. Tell us a little bit about that study because not everyone knows about it and how it's affected really you know, policy in the state. So that's a great question, Victor. And um, as you heard from Jonathan, the General Assembly did ask us to work with Department of Housing and Community Development and we're grateful. Uh, we contracted with um, Housing for Virginia to do a lot of that work. It's a great comprehensive study. 
Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's just a mere 450 pages. So, um, this weekend would be a great time to start looking at it. Uh, there is an executive summary there, right, Jonathan? But it's it's really got so much good data, so much good um, policy um, incorporated in this. And I think now the task for all of us is to dissect it and to look at what we think we can actually get implemented as we move forward. It has been delivered to the General Assembly. Uh, I know here at um, Virginia Housing, we're gonna be having a dialogue with our board to see you know, what we can start to implement. There are a lot of recommendations, everything. One of the most popular recommendations I think was to have some type of a rental subsidy program. Um, mm -hmm. We, you know, that takes a, a lot of commitment from the General Assembly as far as um, the appropriations, but I think it's something that we need to expand the federal voucher program. Um, we know that in Northern Virginia and places like um, all around Northern Virginia, half of the renters there are cost burden. So what can we do to help um, increase the supply of affordable housing? Catherine, I can't thank you enough for Amazon's commitment because GAP funding is exactly what is needed up there for our rental housing programs. Um, there's a shrinking inventory of affordable starter homes. Um, so yeah. I know localities up there are looking at accessible dwelling units and other ways to increase the supply. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in Virginia housing and supply side is to think out of the box. We're doing 3D printed homes, um, steel wow. uh, construction, container homes, a lot of manufactured support. So we got to think differently, both in terms of financing, construction, land use. Um, there's quite a bit in there about what can we do maybe to reduce the property tax burdens um, on um, that it's associated with affordable housing. So um, uh, it, it, the list goes on and on more time than um, would be needed than we have today. But I do invite you to all take a look at this and we can't do everything, but let's start to prioritize what we might be able to do and how we can start to make a difference in this important space. Oh, fantastic. I, I love what you said. We can't do everything, but we can do something. Right. And what we can do, we should do. What and start we can today. do, we should do. That's and right. Start, and start today. today. I like right. that. I like that. All right, Jonathan. So you worked on this HB 854 study also. Any key things that like really apply to Northern Virginia region that, that we should really hone in on um, as opportunities? Sure. So I think one thing that we um, did some research on that uh, was both at a national level and here in Virginia was, how, can we understand what the public opinion of housing and housing affordability is today? And believe it or not, most Americans and most Virginians, four out of five, believe that housing is a critical uh, public policy uh, sector that our policymakers should make investments in. Um, nearly all Virginians believe that anybody who um, lives in a community or who works in a community should be able to live there. Um, and so I think it's important to remember when we have conversations about um, nimbyism or opposition to affordable housing, particularly in high growth areas like Northern Virginia, when we look at what the, the public opinion polls say um, and what the research actually shows is that um, broadly speaking, most people are okay with more housing because they see the value of it. They live in a home themselves and they know what that home does for them. So I think it's important to begin these conversations about why housing is important and why we need more of it and why we need housing that is lower cost um, to begin with your community values, um, why housing is, is necessary and what it means for somebody to secure um, a safe and stable and affordable home. And I think if uh, policymakers at the local level in Northern Virginia um, keep that information in mind and know that for the most part, people are um, and do wanna see more housing, um, they can hopefully be a little more confident when it comes to um, uh, dealing with opposition, which is often just a, a reflection of a very small set of an actual community. And so, um, you know, we have the solutions, we have a lot of resources, it's, a, it's an all of the above approach. Um, but that's one of my favorite things in the study that I hope gets highlighted is that by and large, Virginians like housing, they want more of it. 
um, mm. and, and we need to do everything to, to help them see that through. Great, thank you, Jonathan. So Chairman McKay, you, you and the Board of Supervisors did something that I think it was one of the first in the country. You created um, a diversity, uh, equity and inclusion officer position at the executive level. I think you were one of the first in the nation to do that. So why did you do that? And how does that express itself in housing uh, policy? Well, it's a great question, Victor. I mean, the reason we did it is we passed a one Fairfax social and racial equity policy, and we needed to make sure that the policy went to implementation. Um, and so, you know, a lot of our county agencies, um, you know, might have thought a lot of their employees and staffers might have thought in their mind what they understood equity to be, but we all know that our own life experiences uh, shape what we believe in, in terms of equity. And so we thought it would be important to have an office to provide uniform support for them to understand, you know, where we're going, uh, how you implement equity uh, techniques and, and how you share them with the community. And so uh, one of the most important things is to have uh, an office help our staff, but also to help the community. Um, you know, our community, there's unfortunately a false um, narrative out there in some circles about what equity means. Uh, for us, it means that we have to make an intentional look at every policy we make in Fairfax County to make sure that it's being put in place in an equitable way. And the example I always use to people why this is so important is uh, where you put a bus stop. Uh, used to be, you know, where you have the right of way, where you might think you have the ridership, um, you know, where it fits in nicely with a route. Uh, we look at it now as to a, a key to access and opportunity. And so even something as simple as where you locate a bus stop could have an effect, a profound effect on a family's long term trajectory in terms of access to economic opportunity. And so those things might have looked at before as little decisions or convenient decisions now looked at through a realm of intentional racial and social equity might drive you to a different decision. Uh, when our board takes on major issues now at the Board of Supervisors, you know, we forever have had a category on those policy statements that said fiscal impact. Uh, now we have a category on those most important decisions that says equity impact. And that person and that staff is geared up to help us understand what the equity impacts of the decisions we're making are. Uh, we recently awarded uh, money to a private sector developer uh, to initiate a project that contained a significant amount of affordable housing. Well, there was an equity impact statement on that about why that important you know, step was being taken to provide affordable housing. And so the position is important. It's the work of the position that's so vitally important. And it has to percolate not just our county, the walls of our county facilities, but out into the community too. And so this position is not only helping the policymakers think intentionally about equity, but also helping understand the community, what it means. And, and you know, we've gone so far in a relatively short period of time uh, since this policy is put in place. And, you know, we have boards, authorities and commissions in the county that do everything from looking at health care issues to environmental issues to land use to uh, human services. Um, they all are getting the training and have access to this equity office, too, because it's important for those citizen volunteers to also understand the larger picture we're trying to accomplish in the county and how that fits into maybe the more micro decisions and challenges that they are facing. And so I think it's essential. Um, I think it's becoming more commonplace um, among county governments and municipalities. I know that I often get asked by a lot of jurisdictions in Virginia, you know, how and why we did it. And sharing our experiences is helping them make this more a common element of local government as opposed to an outlier, which is, you know, unfortunately where it still is today, but moving in the right direction. And when you mentioned earlier, you know, we have in Fairfax, being the largest jurisdiction in Virginia, a moral obligation to lead forward on so many of these issues so that other smaller jurisdictions can latch on and, and, and understand them, I think, more fully. And I, that's a responsibility we have. Um, as one of the largest governments in the region, but certainly the largest in Virginia. Oh, great. I, I, I appreciate that. And and we, we only have, believe it or not, two minutes left. I cannot believe where the time went. I have so I have a list of questions, guys. If you saw my list of questions, you'd be like, how did you think you're going to ask all those questions? Um, we're running out of time, but but what I do want to say is that 
all of you have provided such rich, um, you know, quality answers for our, you know, audience. Um, but more than that, you know, you have in your jobs actually executed um, what we're trying to achieve. You know, I mean, Catherine, you are the housing equity fund. That's who you are. You know, Susan, you have been a, 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 a I don't know how to put it. You have been the, the, um, the example, I think, in our region of how you do it across the entire state in as fair possible as as fair way as possible. I mean, from the rural to the urban, you treat them all the same. And 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 Jonathan, your research is now you know part of on on the lips of all of us. So you know, thank you for your contribution. Um, I again, I feel privileged uh, to have the opportunity to be on a panel with such incredible people, but also people who I consider friends. Um, and I really look forward uh, to the next opportunity. I'm hoping that next year um, we'll be able to. Um, be in person. Um, I think that, you know, Ben and the rest of the team are also excited about that. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ben. Thank you so much. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our presenters for this first session, including our moderator and our panelists. Uh, we, we really appreciate your contributions to the discussion this session. 